Today we commemorate, and notice I said the word commemorate because we're not celebrating. Celebrating doesn't seem like the right word, but we commemorate the crucifixion of Jesus. And we remember that liturgically speaking, we are not simply remembering that Jesus died. We are transporting ourselves back to that very day and that very place. During our service, we are with Jesus as he is beaten and as he is spat upon and as he is nailed to the cross and ultimately as he dies on the cross. We're with him right now. This isn't something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's happening right now during our liturgy. It's the most somber day on our entire calendar. It's the only day of the year where there is no celebration of Holy Eucharist. Now, it's important to note that not all Christians follow the same calendar, so we don't all recognize today as Good Friday. For our Eastern Christian siblings in Christ, Good Friday is actually next Friday. But remember, liturgy transcends time and space so even though we're not observing Good Friday with all of our Christian sisters and brothers on this same day on our secular calendar, we are observing it together with them, liturgically speaking. God's time is different than our time. And while it's true there is no uh, official Holy Saturday Eucharist, the Easter Vigil is often celebrated on Holy Saturday. So the first Eucharist of Easter is celebrated in many places on Holy Saturday night. And because Jesus dies on the cross on Good Friday, today is a day of fasting and prayer and mourning. And yet, as a preacher, I'm called to preach the good news. That's what gospel means, evangelion, good news. So where is the good news on Good Friday? Now, some people might say that the good news is found in the Easter story. They say that you can't have Easter without Good Friday. And I suppose in some roundabout way, uh, that's potentially true. But remember, we're transporting ourselves back to that time and that place. And the people around Jesus didn't know that Easter was going to come two days later. So we have to imagine that we don't know either. Good Friday was not the cause of Easter. Good Friday was a tragic, tragic day. So again, we ask the question, where is the good news? Now, before we get to the good news, we're going to go deeper and deeper into the not-so-good news. I'm inviting you to stay with me on this one because it's uncomfortable. And we all know the importance of discomfort during the liturgy. After all, we've, we've had our altar move for the last month and a half. And we've been saying the alternate translation of the Lord's Prayer. And during Lent, things have simply been different. We like to be comfortable, but Lent is not comfortable. And Good Friday is certainly not comfortable. So I want to talk about two apostles with you. We're going to talk a little bit about Judas and about Peter. You see, Judas and Peter, in a lot of ways, are kind of the anti-heroes of the Good Friday story, at least when it comes to the apostles. Judas, as we know, is the apostle who betrayed Jesus last night. And Peter, as we know and we just heard, is the disciple who denied Jesus, even though he promised he wouldn't. As we said, more not so good news. So where is it? And I would argue that on Good Friday, the good news is found in something called grace. 
What is grace? Grace is a gift from God. It's unearned and it's undeserved and it is freely given. You and I are beneficiaries of grace. Peter was a beneficiary of grace. And although it's debated among scholars, I believe Judas is also the beneficiary of grace. Now let's start with Peter, because his story is the easy story. Peter was not outlined as the person who's known as the beloved disciple in John's gospel. But he was, however, Jesus' right-hand man. And on the night Jesus was betrayed by Judas, Peter promised Jesus he would not deny him. Jesus told him he would, in fact, deny him, not once, but three times. And sure enough, Jesus' prediction was correct. Now, all four Gospels tell us that Peter denied Jesus. And yet, Peter went on to be the, the leader of the church. Jesus gave Simon the name Peter, which means rock, Petros. And he said, upon this rock, upon this Petros, I will build my church. Despite his denial of Jesus, Peter is given authority by Jesus to possess the keys to the church. And what about our friend Judas? Well, history has not been so kind to Judas. In Matthew's gospel, we're told that Judas killed himself by hanging. There's also a legend that St. Jude, Judas Thaddeus, would later become known as the patron saint of hopeless causes. And that's because people were afraid to pray to him for intercession. Why? Well, because they didn't want the proverbial phone lines to become crossed. And they didn't want to make it seem like they were praying to Judas Iscariot. So when all other hope was lost, they'd pray to St. Jude, Judas Thaddeus. Because at that point, they were ready to try anything. But I believe Judas is still the beneficiary of the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, why do I believe this? Because the Gospels tell us that Judas was present at the Lord's Supper. And during that same supper, Jesus shared his predictions about not only Peter, but also Judas. Jesus knew. He knew Peter would deny him. And he knew Judas would betray him. And what did he do? He still offered up his body and blood to both of them. He shared communion with them. He extended to them some grace. Now, there's another man who received the grace of Jesus on that Good Friday, a man whom tradition calls Dismas. Our Gospels tell us that Jesus was crucified with two others, one on each side. One man repents of his crimes and the other mocks Jesus. Now, they are not named in the scriptures, but Dismas, also known as Saint Dismas, is the thief who repented. Gestas is the thief who did not repent. And on the cross, Jesus tells Dismas that he will be with him in paradise. In other words, heaven. Despite his crime, he was extended grace. And he is venerated as a Christian saint. He's the patron saint of those who are imprisoned. And he's the patron saint of those who are on death row. In the chapel at San Quentin State Prison in California, his icon looks out over the inmates. And his, his sainthood is a reminder of the grace that Jesus extends to the incarcerated. It's a reminder of the grace that he extends to Peter and to Judas. It's a reminder of the grace that he extends to us. Now, as Gestas 
claimed Jesus indeed could have removed himself from the cross. Jesus can do anything he wants. He's God after all. Which means that he gave himself to suffering and death freely. He went along with it. He died a brutal and painful death voluntarily. He died that death for you and he died that death for me. He died that death for Dismas. He died that death for Gestas. He died that death for Peter. He died that death for Judas. Yes, even Judas. Dismas reminds us that none of us is as bad as the worst thing we've ever done. Peter is not as bad as denying Jesus three times. Judas is not as bad as betraying him. The inmates at San Quentin are not as bad as the crimes they committed that put them in prison. I'm not as bad as the worst thing I've ever done and you're not as bad as the worst thing you've ever done. And that right there, that is the good news of the Good Friday story. Through his death, Jesus extends to us some grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We simply receive it. He offers it freely. When we acknowledge our sinfulness, he extends forgiveness. Not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. The Good Friday story is about love. Love hung on a cross. Love had his heart penetrated by a spear. Love was removed from the cross and love was placed in a tomb. When we leave here today, I invite us to reflect on grace and love. Jesus loves Peter. Jesus loves Dismas. Jesus loves Gestas. Jesus loves Judas. And yes, Jesus loves you and me. Let's go and do likewise. Amen.